All right. You know what this month is? It's June. That's what this month is. The title of my message today is Pride. All right. Let's turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. There are deception. There's a deception about the kingdom. We live in a kingdom. The Bible's about a king, his king. The Bible's about a king, his kingdom, and his royal offspring. All right? And so I want us to move into some things because how many believe Jesus is going to return? How many believe like everything's in alignment for him to come? I mean, everything's on the planet today. Everything. But there's still a work to do. And one work to do, this gospel of the kingdom, not another gospel of Jesus, but the gospel of the kingdom is to preach in every nation as a testimony and the end will come. And I can mark off a few nations because I've been there preaching the kingdom myself. Okay? I know I'm not the only one. I'm just saying the ones I know I've been to, I can say, Lord, you can take Nicaragua off. You can come back. You can take the United States off. You can come back. You can take Poland off. You can come back. These are, these are done. This has happened in my generation. Are you hearing me? And things are, are, are in the earth today so that God can take up his church and the tribulation of God can manifest. Amen. So that God one more time extend mercy to humanity. I said one more time. Even in the tribulation, he will um, extend mercy. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. It says this, the Holy Spirit has explicitly revealed at the end of this age, say this age, this age. say this age. this age, many, now that Makes you sad, not glad right here, that word right there. <laughs> Many will depart from the true faith one after another. Many will depart, which tells us they used to partake. They were once apart. They were once worshiping on this stripe just like you. They were once running around a building just like you. They were once sitting in classes just like you. They were once in a prayer meeting like you. They were once teaching a class like you. They were once in pulpits. Are you hearing me? And how many will depart? How many? Now, we as a church, we're looking for the great harvest. But there's an equal great thing that will take place in the end, and that is a great departure. I almost liken it to the Exodus. I almost liken it to the Exodus. The Lord sends Moses in to Egypt to deliver his people, right? They have been victims. For 432 years. It was them and it was through that nation that Egypt prospered like it did because of a guy named Joseph. Right? So much wealth manifested in that nation because of Joseph. But a Pharaoh rose up that did not know Joseph and suppressed the nation of Israel. And as a result of that, God... After a period of time, and he told this to Abraham, the man he was in covenant with, that I'm going to send somebody and deliver them away from that nation. So he goes in with miracle signs and wonders. I said miracle signs. They were in a revival. They were in a move of God that shook an entire nation. They saw the exploits of God in physical manifestation, performing the word he sent through a man, let my people go. Amen. And so Moses delivers them. 
brings them through the Red Sea over to the other side into the wilderness, and they watch their enemy die. Whoa, how great was that work? I mean, he wants the, the Israelites to know you'll never have to uh, not rest in your sleeping and be concerned when you're over here that he's coming across to get you. They watched him die. Why are we so concerned about the devil still? Christ has full principalities and powers. He has stripped him of all of his power. But we act like that he can come run us down. So here they are seeing their enemy die. They know the ruler can't, won't, nor give commands for them to come after them. Yet three days in, they cry. They just went through a Holy Ghost revival that shook a nation, set them free, broke all their chains. I mean, if we sing another song about chain breaking. Because everybody wants their chains break only to put chains on themselves. <laughs> They'll never break a chain off their mind. <laughs> so crazy. Breaking the chains. They were, chain, they were a chain-breaking generation, but yet never renewed their mind. So the Lord is like, Moses, these people are stubborn and stiff-necked. They're rebellious. This is who I went and got. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe them out. And start with you. <laughs> I'll just eliminate. Now, who's he eliminating? Not the whole nation. The stubborn, the stiff neck, and the rebellious. Now, Moses happened to know how many in his congregation were stubborn, stiff necked, and rebellious. I'm gonna say that again. Moses knew how many in his congregation were stubborn, stiff necked, and rebellious. So he goes to the Lord and he says, if you do that, it will look like a massacre. And all the nations are going to draw this conclusion that you have brought them out, not to free them, but to kill them. Because it's going to look like you killed everybody. So for your name's sake, let's don't do that. The Lord's like, fine. I'll eliminate them yearly. He still got rid of them. It just, he did it in a process of 40 years. I'll just eliminate them yearly. Because they said I couldn't bring their kids in, I'm bringing their kids in. They said I couldn't do it, but I'm still going to do it. But they're not going to be there to see it. Now, if you read the number that came out of Egypt and read the number that went into the promised land is extremely close. I mean, only a few thousand off. So the Lord in 40 years was able to replace so that the nation looked like it was maintaining the same size. Although he was eliminating Stubborn, stiff-necked, and rebellious people. So when he says many will depart from the true faith, I'm wondering, will the great harvest be the many that depart God's going to replace with someone new? Which means if you are of the departed, God's already seeking out your replacement. And guess what? He's going to replace you with somebody you're not thinking he should. He's going to replace you with someone you don't think qualifies. <laughs> okay. Now, you, you can settle day. I am not the departed. I'm not the departed. And I, this message today will help you from becoming the departed. That's what it'll do. it empower you. But again, you can't be empowered about something unless you know what you need to be empowered to. 
He said, the Holy Spirit has explicitly revealed me, and this is going to happen. You can't stop it. No good sermon or move of God will stop this from happening. No miraculous move of God will hinder this from occurring. It's going to occur. Many will depart from the true faith one after another, devoting themselves to spirits of deception and following demon-inspired revelations and theories. Hypocritical liars will deceive many, and their conscience won't bother them at all. Wow. So again, this is somebody that was running in the church you're running in, that was praising in the church you were praising in, that was serving in the church you're serving in, that was teaching in the church you're teaching in, that received the awards and the, and the acknowledgments and the accolades in the church that you're in, they'll actually go over and still be in church, but into the churches where there's no sound doctrine anymore, where there's false prophets, where there's false teachers, where they're picking up every wind and doctrine and appeasement to the world and their flesh, and you will be the subject of their persecution. Say amen anyway. It's just going to happen. So how do you guard yourself from being one of the many? And what would cause someone who knew true faith to now be an entertainer of deception? Now, why is this so important? Because it tells me I don't care how spiritually mature you have become. You are not free from the ability to be deceived. You're not free. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't constantly and every time not be deceived. You can resist it, stand against it. I'm going to show you today. But you can never arrive to a place of spiritual maturity and life in God that deception could not come to your life. And you fall prey. Because these will be demon-inspired revelations and theories. See, we already know that the most of the church today, especially in the United States, especially in the United States, are going to be the most susceptible to this is because the only way you're going to truly understand the voice of the Holy Spirit is to be an actual avid reader of the Bible itself. Now, when you're an avid reader of the Bible, when I say that, I'm not just talking about reading the Bible, checking the box like we read the Bible and check boxes, because we read the Bible and check boxes. We have a Bible reading plan we do every year. It is you go into that word with a desire and allowing the Holy Ghost to talk to you while you're reading that word so that not only can he reveal things to you so that you can learn and discover more of who God is, but you allow him also to reveal things about yourself and how you can overcome deficiencies in your soul realm that he needs to continue to modify and transform so that he can release all that the Spirit of God in you wants to be. All right? And so here, if you're not an avid studier of the Word in rightly dividing the Word of truth, then you're already susceptible to demon-inspired revelations and theories because there's one Holy Spirit, but there are a plethora of demonic spirits, and they're talking. Now, the voice that most people hear, believers and those that are outside God's kingdom, is their flesh. It does enough talking on its own. But the enemy will whisper, And they are, according to the Bible, called familiar spirits. I said they're called familiar spirits. Now, a familiar spirit is someone, uh, as a demon or an unclean spirit, that is around situations. They're not like the Holy Spirit that is everywhere at all times. They actually have to be there. Okay? Which means if there is an unclean spirit or familiar spirit following you, they know what you wore on Tuesday just like the Holy Ghost does. 
I'm going to say that again. They know what you wore on Tuesday just like the Holy Ghost does. Why? Because it's just a fact. And facts aren't always just truth. Facts try to put the demonic realm in a position so that you would believe you're hearing the spirit of truth because the facts are accurate. Are you hearing me? And when you are not a studier of the word, rightly dividing the word of truth, then it's easy as you're trying to lean into be led by the spirit, you can hear other voices. And you're going to have to learn how to discern those. And there's only one way to discern is through having a solid foundation in the word. There will never be a substitution from just studying the word. The church will never arrive to a place that the teaching, preaching, and studying of the word is no longer required. And it is monotonous. It is foundational. It is necessary. It is not glamorous. But it is life-changing. It is the very breath you should breathe. Because his word is life. Are you hearing me? So here are those who once heard the spirit... But because of an issue, have now allowed themselves to hear another voice and is willing to follow it. And the Bible tells us many, many will depart. Well, what is it that causes a true believer filled with the Holy Ghost who once accurately discerned the Holy Spirit? to get caught up and become subject to this. Well, turn over to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Hallelujah. Proverbs 16, 18 says it this way. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. So what would cause this born again, on fire, tongue talking, devil casting out, laying hands on the sick, raising the dead believer to get into deception? Pride. The passion says this way, your boast becomes a prophecy of your future failure. The higher you lift up yourself in pride, the harder you'll fall in disgrace. Right? Now, pride has to originate somewhere. And Obadiah tells us where pride originates. And Obadiah chapter 1, verse 3, it says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. I said, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose inhabitants is high, who has said in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Now, here's the thing. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says it this way. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Do not be deceived. In essence, don't let pride manifest in your heart. Because you'll move to deception. And don't be deceived. Because when you get there... God's not going to be mocked by you. Now, if this was just because we are in the situation we're in in the planet today is the only reason why pride is a problem, well, you know, I get it. But where did pride originally show up? 
And what environment was it that pride manifested? Did it start when sin was somewhere? No, pride is able to manifest in perfect godly environments. Now, let's go back to where pride is introduced. And we got to go to Isaiah. In Isaiah... Chapter 14, verse 11, the modern King James Version says it this way. It says, your pride is brought down to the grave, and the noise of your harps, the maggot is spread under you, and the worms cover you. Verse 12, how you have fallen from the heavens. You have what? You have what? What comes with pride? Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. You've heard it said pride comes before the fall. And this is the first recorded fall. And what caused that fall? Pride. 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 This morning star was in the creation of heaven. was doing the works of creation, was working for the creator. Yet, all of a sudden, he's fallen from heaven. Why? Oh, shining star, son of the morning, you, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will go up to the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will go up above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to hell from the sides of the pit. Jesus said in Luke, he said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Pride was found in a perfectly created cherub, an anointed cherub at that, an anointed cherub, an anointed cherub. Pride manifested in the presence of all creation. And what did pride do? Pride had the ability in this one created anointed cherub that was created by God to have an assignment and to stay in their position. And do what they were created to do. Was able to convince a third of other created beings. That they could do things better than God. In essence, the word that he wills, that he speaks, that he commands. I can do it better. In fact, we shouldn't have to obey it. In fact, let's don't even obey it. Do what I'm saying. And in the realm of heaven, a war broke out. And Jesus said, hmm, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When pride got manifested in heaven, God threw him down. Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let him have dominion over the birds of the sea. I mean, over the birds of the sky, over the fish of the sea, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, over all the cattle, over all the earth. He was making man in his image according to his likeness. Are you hearing me? The first thing he said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. First, let him have our image. Let him function and operate like we do. And here's the thing. Let man be in our image. The image of God is love. And God always does what he says he will do. Because that's what love does. 
Then he said, let him have dominion. Because he's in my image, he can have dominion. Because I always keep my word. Always. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my it will never pass. I will always keep my word. Now, if you weren't with us at the beginning of the year, we did an exhaustive study about the love of God. And we found that God always does his word. Always. So when man fell and God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, that was his word. I want man to have dominion. But when man fell from dominion, now no one's in dominion. So how can God give man the opportunity to be back in dominion? He has to send his own son. Who then will be man, be God wrapped in the flesh, do the word entirely, and then sacrifice himself, make the payment for the word he spoke to Adam. Adam, you can eat from any tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day you eat, you will surely die. Turn over to Genesis chapter 3. We see this in Genesis chapter 3. We'll start in verse 1, and it says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said... You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, we know that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you shall die. And the serpent said to the woman, you surely will. That's pride talking. Because the minute you say something contrary to God, <coughs> that's pride. I'm going to say that again. The minute you say something contrary to what God has said he will do, that's pride. Because the pride here means to be exalted. So you're exalting your situation or condition and how you should handle it over how God declares you to handle it. Well, that may work for you to forgive them, but for me. Pride. Well, that may work for you to be healed, but pride. And this is why healing can't get to your life. Well, that may be good for you to laugh, okay, but for me. Well, that's called pride. Just like when we said, well, be glad. And if you couldn't even in the natural go, well, okay. <laughs> pride yeah. was in the atmosphere. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I'm not going to do what he says. The Bible says to be glad. Yeah. We're only doing scripture here. Right. And he says, you're not supposed to do the scripture when you feel like it. Because right. we're not led by sight. We're led by faith. Say amen anyway. I mean, again, this whole service is conditioned so that you will put down your flesh, renew your mind, and act on the word of God. I mean, if all of a sudden by unction said, well, dance before the Lord. Well, does the Bible talk about dancing? Well, then whether you feel like dancing or not, you ought to at least go. Well, I mean, do some kind of shuffle. I mean, how hard is that? But pride will say, I don't dance. Oh, so the Lord asks you to do something you can't do. It's the heart. I mean, there's a whole other reason why you're actually not doing it, although I'm going to be the blame, or Pastor Marcus is going to be the blame, or Pastor Marcy is going to be blame, or whoever's speaking, you're going to blame somebody else. For your inability to do the word. Yeah, come on. No, what you're doing is you're entertaining demon-inspired revelations and theories. Because you can't act on the word today. No. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just smile. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, honestly, it would be an embarrassment, really, if I just went down one by one and said, smile, and see if you would do it. But let me tell you, God is not... He's not mocked. And something this simple, if that bothers you, you got a problem. And your sin is crouching at your door now. Because pride is starting to elevate in you. That you'll decide when you're going to do it. Well, the minute you decide, you're Lord. You're supreme in authority. You're God. Oh, I didn't realize you created the heavens and the earth. My bad. No. I mean, this is simple. Really, living the word is simple. It really is simple. You just got to hate your old self enough to love your new self. And I love my new self way more than I, than I love my old self. I hate my old self because my old self was wicked, wicked, and bound for a pit. I love my new self because he made me in Christ. He said what I can be. He told me I was victorious. He said I was an overcomer. He said that I had the love of God shed abroad in my heart. And I believe that whether I feel it or not. And I'll act on it. Because I'm not going to be the many who depart from the one true faith. Listen. It's because we just don't look at scripture right. I mean, literally, that day will come. Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we? And he'll say, I don't even know who you are. Depart from me, I don't know who you are. Now, I'm not talking about throwing you into hell. But there may be an invitation to the marriage supper of the land that you don't make. See, everybody thinks things are automatic. Is healing automatic? Healing comes by what? You better believe and be in faith that your life and living is in the position that when the trumpet blows, you get to go. All right. It's all right. I mean, do we think that these people here that are going to depart are going to be caught up in the marriage supper of the Lamb? But it doesn't say that they technically are not ever going to uh, be with God. They just realize, dude, I didn't live it. I was full of pride. I have fallen from the opportunity to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's good. Hmm. Yeah, I better crucify my flesh for sure now. Amen. Jesus said, don't think that I've come to abolish the law. I've come to tighten it up. Meaning, it, you are more responsible in this dispensation than any other dispensation. Why? Because you are a new creature in Christ now, and you have the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. And if you can't obey the Spirit of God inside you now, and you think that's still a free ticket to heaven? Hallelujah. So... He said, she says, you, you're not going to die, he says, verse 4. For God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God. They were already like God, knowing good and evil. But God knew good and evil, he didn't. They did not. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from it. She took from its fruit and ate, and she also gave also to her husband with her, and he, and he ate. And we call this the fall of man. We call it the fall of man, but why did man fall? Pride. Because Jesus himself says, to the world. Now, when I say the world, the world has two types of people living in it. Those that have no affiliation to any type of actual devotion to God himself. But then there is another group in the world that is extremely devoted to God through religion. They are religious in essence. I can do what you have said on my terms and you have to honor it. That's religion. 
That's works of religion. It's you actually being Lord of the words he has spoken, and you're interpreting it to him. Come on, you hear what I'm saying? Seriously, have we not had some business owners that have some employees that you told them one thing, <laughs> and then they went and told a coworker something entirely different, and you're like, that is not what I said, and you have misrepresented me. You have redefined what I said to fit your excuse to do a work a certain way. They took your words. They said, this is what he said, but then put, spun a meaning on that deal so that it would benefit their own personal lives. And man has done this with God's word from the beginning. From the beginning. So what environment did Adam and Eve fall from? What was planet Earth like? perfection. No sin on the planet. The Bible tells us in Romans 5 that when Adam ate the fruit, through one man's transgression, sin entered the world. Sin wasn't in the world. It doesn't matter that the serpent was in the world and that the devil was there because it, he had no literal power at all. No authority. All he had was a suggestion, a theory. A new revelation. A new revelation. I have a new revelation for you. You've never heard this before, but I'm telling you, it's true. You're not going to die. Because God knows that the minute you eat this, you'll be like him knowing good and evil. And that statement alone doesn't let us understand the full weight of what was actually revealed there. That Adam himself would say, I'll just rebel against God. I'll do the same action. In essence, he had to have the same spirit that the morning star, the King James calls him Lucifer, picked up in his heart. I can do that. Who's he telling me what I'm supposed to do? I got some thoughts on my own. Be honest with you, I think they work. And you know what? He should listen to me. You know how many years we've been eating every other fruit? And there's tons of them. Hadn't even got to half of them. But you know what? Who's he to say that he keeps these for himself? He, I can't have them. Who does he think he is? Telling me. I walk by it every day. It's right in the middle of the garden. He's going to remind me, and I can't have it. I mean, who does he think he is? Now, none of you would say that, right? None of you would like, I never have said that. I'd have never said that. Really? Who does he think he is not to forsake the assembling of himself together? Who does he think he is? Who does he think he is that I'm supposed to um, walk by the Spirit and not deal with this situation in the flesh? I mean, he don't know what they did to me. I mean, he does know what they did to you. <laughs> But you want to handle that situation different than the way he wants to handle it. Pride. Pride comes before. Here's the thing. If you'll recognize, you know, and I'm being prideful right now, you can stop before falling comes. I said you can stop before falling comes. But let me tell you something. It's as clear as clear can be. Know that this is going to take place. You cannot sidestep it. You can't be in pride and not ever fall. Just like you can't sin and it not be found out. For your sin will maybe, could happen. But you know what? People act like it would maybe not happen. I can get away with it. Because they come in here on the same line and worship God. They praise, raise their hands. Yet on another night, they doing something else. And the Lord in his mercy allows him to continue to get in his environment. 
That doesn't mean he's accepting your alternative behavior. And his grace is allowing you to do it. It means he's just long-suffering. And all the while talking to you, what are you doing? What are you doing right now? You need to quit doing that. Stop doing that. If you repent right now, I act like it never happened. If you repent right now, I'll act like it never happened. And we can deal with the consequences of your actions. But you're going to have to repent. So it's a perfect heaven environment that Lucifer gets pride in his heart. And it's a perfect heaven and earth environment again. That, that Adam gets pride in his heart. Well, now what environment are we in? Unfortunately, pride is all around us. I mean, it like thrives here in the earth. I mean, it grows without being stopped. I mean, it is amazing how pride... And we already know that it's in the, the heart of man that has never made Jesus the Lord of their life. Why is he not Lord of their life? Because of pride. I'm not going to submit to him. You know what? How do we know he's the only one anyway? You know, I got a God, and I'm going to do just fine with that one. Right? Yet Paul himself writes to a church that he established. The one in Galatia. He starts off the letter, you know, he gets through the first couple of chapters, right? And in uh, those two chapters, he talks about how he's been crucified with Christ. Yeah. It's no longer him who lives, but Christ lives in him. I mean, he's passionate about this new life in Christ and being totally submitted to the lordship of Jesus because he's king of the kingdom. Yes. I'm not in a religion. So I can't go around thinking the king is going to yield to my whims. That I get to kind of determine what image I make Jesus. What image do I want to form him in, in my likeness? This is happening all over the place. Why? Because the Bible says that God emptied himself. He became a man, and he was tempted on all accounts like us. In essence, we do not have a high priest that doesn't know our sufferings, meaning he knows everything you feeling right now because he himself has suffered it. But you know what? In his suffering, he did not sin because he's a man who knew no sin, which means when he felt like he wanted to get revenge, he didn't. When he felt like he wanted to sleep with someone, he didn't. When he felt like he wanted to lie about somebody, he didn't. When he felt like he wanted to talk bad about somebody, he didn't. When he wanted to kill somebody, he didn't. When he wanted to say, do you know who I am? Really, you going to pull my beard out right now? I bring a legion of angels down. I done told my boys in the garden. You hit me one more time. Oh, y'all don't want to hear that. I mean, I can show you a whole world of people. You hit me one more time. <laughs> and they have the means to annihilate the place. But Jesus knew. It's coming. It's just not coming right now. But I'm praying you won't be among the ones that get it. Even to his own enemies, he's like, I hope you change. I hope you change. And they punch him again, and I hope you change. And they punch him again, I hope you change. And they punch him again, I hope you change. And they scourge his back, I hope you change. And they take more flesh out, I hope you change. Because then when he looks at him, beaten so bad he can't tell he was a man totally naked on the cross, he says, Forgive them, Father. And they don't know what they do. And he gave up his spirit. And then we're going to act like we can't forgive. 
He says, man, I take your sin and throw it into the sea of It's gone. I don't bring it back to my mind. I know how you're feeling. But I know how you cannot sin in how you're feeling. And if you don't be prideful right now, I'll give you an answer, a way of excuse. But if you're going to be prideful, falling's coming. It's coming. Because every time, here's the, th- the, the wicked thing about pride. Pride has this ability to make you think you're getting away with something. And that you're justified. Because pride in, in the root of itself is what I say about this is higher than what God says about this. And if you respond to multiple situations continually having that attitude, then pride will fully take over and you'll be deceived. And it'd be easy for the devil to feed you half-truths. You know what half-truth is? It's the truth with a little spin on it. That's what he did to Eve. The Bible says he deceived Eve, that she was deceived. What did he do? He said, what's God say? Is that what he said? Well, okay, I get it, but there's one part. I'm going to add a word, not, because you know what? You're really not going to die. Right. Yeah. I want to know what he said. That's eh, really not going to happen, because here's the deal. You'll be like God, and she's already heard that. Right. Yeah. There's something God knows you don't know, and that's why he won't let you eat the fruit. He's holding out on you. I mean, you're like him, but you're not like him. Now, if you want to get totally like him, then you eat the fruit. And how many believers are constantly doing things contrary to the word, and yet they would call themselves humble? Here's one of the most pride-filled statements ever. You ready? Well, I know the Lord can heal me. I get it. But you know, not my will, but his will be done. I just want what's best from the Lord. Who am I to tell God to heal me? Well, God said he heal you. Just receive it. But the enemy has given you a revelation, a theory that you're learning something because you're special to have this. And you actually glorify God more with it. And there's many that are carrying sickness in their lives as a badge of the Lord. Instead of studying the scripture to find out that in the healthcare system of the kingdom, by his stripes she were healed, And that they can walk in the healing of God for the sake of their purpose. Come on, you hearing what I'm saying? So we'll carry things around like we're humble, but the reality is we're acting or behaving or we're allowing things in our lives that are against the word. Well, you know, my family, you know, they just get mad. That's just how it happens, right? I mean, it's just how it happens. You know, it's just part of our, you know, DNA. No, you got a new DNA. You're in Christ. Now, the Lord can tell you how to get angry and not sin. Y'all doing all right? I think I got some dozers. I mean, if you worked all night, I get it. Uh, But, you know, if you're like, well, let's just got to hush up so I can go. Well, you don't have to stay. You can just get up, move, leave. It don't bother me one bit. You've walked out of movies before. Walk out of this. It don't bother me. (laughs) I'm not hurt. But my life's not in you. (laughs) But what I'm saying will save your life. Will keep you from being prideful. And falling and being part of the many who depart. Because it's going to happen. Let's close with Proverbs chapter 8. 
I'm going to close with this, because I'm going to probably pick this up next week. Now, I've done announced that, so we'll see how many show up. <laughs> we may have a mini depart. It already happened. A mini, mini depart. A mini, mini have departed. <laughs> Go ahead and look at your neighbor. See who's here. That way you'll know next week. Where is... They must have failed this week. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Again, if that bothers you, then there's something wrong with your own heart. Because when you're free in the Lord, man, I mean, you know, listen, I know I'm following God. I love God. I have no issue. The only person in uncomfortable in this room today is those who have an issue with God. Because again, they don't have an issue with a person. Because our battle is very clear. The Bible says your battle's not against. So you can't give me a name that you got a problem with. You don't have a problem with a person. You have a problem with the word of God on how to handle the current situation you're in. That's your problem. And you're in pride. And you need to get out of your pride and go ahead and yield to the word he has already given to you on how to handle this situation. Because you're only going to hear this here. You're only going to hear this here. Because I'll never be moved by your situation. But I will say it is. It's written. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Proverbs 8, verse 13. This is good. You want to get out of pride? Here you go. The fear of the Lord. You got to be a person who wants to honor God at his word at every cost more than hold on to a perception of how this thing should go down according to you, the gospel of you. You know how many people are writing their own gospels? The gospel according to no, you're not inspired gospel. Because if your words are not his words, then you're not inspired. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth. What's it say? Who hates this? Now, we say, God, this is talking about wisdom. Okay. And, and obviously, wisdom and understanding. You, you should read the whole chapter, to be honest with you. You want to help and get ahead for next week? Not that I'm technically going back into this passage of the scripture next week, but it will help you. You should read this particular one next week to help yourself, to put yourself in a position that you don't ever get in pride. And pride, again, by its simplest definition, is you taking a thought and exalting it above God's word in that situation and doing it instead. You're in pride. And if you keep doing that, you're going to fall because it's producing sin. Because you're doing something contrary to how God says to do it. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance in the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate. But God is love. Love hates. Counsel is mine in sound wisdom. My, I am understanding. Power is mine. Listen. God has delegated you power, and he will allow you to make your own choice, but he'll hold you accountable to the words that you are exalting and allowing to govern and rule your life. And if those words are not his words, then there's an impending outcome. So he's saying... Counsel's mine. How should I handle this situation? Well, what's the Lord say? Counsel's his. He's not, counsel, he's not consulting you. So how do you feel about doing it this way? God is not a psychiatrist. So tell me, how does that make you feel? Now, you know, I would say 
that you should do this. But, but how does that make you feel? Well, is that you're uncomfortable with that? Okay. Hmm. Well, what do you think we should do? And this is the God most people want. The God that they can manipulate with their feelings and hurts. I mean, you might as well get that one God. What is it? What's the uh, uh, Miss Amita over in India, the, the, the big statue that's got like three, six arms, it's painted black, and it's the God of revenge? I know, I called you on the spot. There's only 3,000 gods in India, okay? So it's not like this is an easy one. What's her name? Shiva? Okay. So which one they pray when they want revenge on somebody? What's her name? Durga. Okay. So they pray. That's what we want our God to turn into. I'm hurt. Can you deal with that? Can you go cut them down and kill that? Yeah. Kali is another name. Jet Black. Okay. Yeah, so we're like, you know, Lord, I don't know that I can do that. It doesn't make me feel great. So why don't we do it this way? Because I feel better if you just eliminate them from me seeing them ever. Being around them. Having to deal with that. I mean, you know, you understand Paul actually asked the Lord to try to handle a couple things. He said, now, Lord, can you uh, take care of this? And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you, son. And so don't ask me again to move these religious people who keep running behind you and trying to disrupt the word you have. And that's why your Galatia church is going crazy is because somebody got in there and now you're having to write a letter back to them and say, who has deceived you? That you got so prideful now thinking you're going to tell God how he is to respond to you. And I realize that you want them to, but at the end of the day, listen, I'm not stopping it. Because when a person knows me, that's enough. Because you know what they'll know? They'll know it doesn't matter what happened to you, how it happened to you, when it happened to you, because I will vindicate you. I will bring vengeance for you. I will forgive you. But if the one that did it or the multiplicity of all the things that's ever happened in your life, if any people try to get right, then guess what? I'll forgive them. Because if I've forgiven you, you're going to want them to be forgiven because you know that they only act in that way because they're wicked. And if they'll repent and get right, then it's better. And we can live in harmony and unity. So if I can forgive you and heal you, it ain't just for you. So he says, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. Power is mine. By me, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who judge rightly. I love those who love me and those who diligently seek me will find me. So if somebody don't know how to handle a situation, I'd say you're not seeking Because the scripture says you'll find it. Riches and honor are with me. Enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even pure gold. I mean, people will walk away from church, but won't walk away from their jobs. They'll put up with bad employees before they'll put up with a congregation member that makes a mistake. And my yield better than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of justice to endow those who love me with wealth that I may fill their treasure. I'm telling you, I just like, give me your word. (laughs) I want your understanding. Now jump down to verse 32. Now, therefore, O sons, that's us. Listen to me, wisdom says, for blessed are you who keep, who what? 
keep my ways. When are you blessed? When you keep. Let me say this. When you keep the word, you're blessed. But if you quit keeping the word, the blessing you have will run its course. And there's many people who aren't keeping the word anymore, but are proclaiming his blessings. And they're talking about old ones that arrived when they kept it. And then the devil or the demon-inspired revelations and theories begins to woo them off and substitutes what wisdom will bring naturally, wealth, prosperity, and will say, listen to me, and I'll give you the same wealth. And Jesus said, what good is it a man that he gains the world and forfeits his and there are many believers today that aren't keeping his word, aren't acting on his word, aren't behaving his word, but they're shouting still. They're still singing songs, but yet they're living like the world. They're carnal like the world. They behave like the world. They respond to situations like the world. And then their own self-efforts, they call God's blessing because that demon-inspired revelation says, God did that for you. And yet, we hate people who sit beside us. We're at odds with our brother. We have division among us. Now, I'm not saying here, although it can be here. Honestly, it's in every church. Can I just tell you that? I would love to tell you that you're all perfect. You're perfect in Christ if you yield to it. Paul said, Demas has left me. Demas was right there. Saw saw the miracles God did through my ministry. He was right there in the revelations and the teachings that came from the Lord. But you know what? He's loved this present world more and he has left me. Was there one day, gone tomorrow? Where'd they go? Where did they go? Where'd they been going the whole time? Where'd they been going under your nose? Now, therefore, all sons, listen to me. For blessed are those who keep my ways. Heed instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts. Or post, we could say. Y'all should be looking for God's post instead of your social media posts. Because God's posting every day. For he who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord, but he who what? Sins against me injures him. Injures who? Although they think they're causing harm to everybody else. No, they're only injuring themselves, and all those who hate me love death. Well, who hates the Lord? Those who don't fear him. Those who will take a thought contrary to God in a situation and say, I'm going to do it this way, and ain't nobody going to tell me otherwise. You know when I know people are in danger at Anchor Faith Church, St. Augustine, is when they won't meet with me. They won't meet with me because they know what's going to happen. Well, he's going to bring that word out. Man, I'm just, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just say amen anyway. You say, Pastor, I've not met with you. No problem here. You don't have to meet with me. (laughs) I get it. I'm just saying, if you're going through something and hell has showed up at your door, trial, tribulation is trying to beat down everything, you are in some of the worst situations of your life. 
And no matter what you're personally doing, you can't see him. And if you can't come here, because there's tons in the room that know how this goes down. And the word works every time. I said, and the word works every time. And the word works every time. And the word works every time. Come on, and the word works every time. And the word works every time. And the word works every time. Because you know, I am not taking your side. I only take one side. It's righteousness side. That's the only side I take. I'll only take that side. And I can't help that that happened to you. I can't help that this happened to you. All I know is this is what God says you can do. And you'll be free. And you can run. And you can frolic. And you'll have victory. And you'll crush the devil's head. I know it. Because when we move, just like today, I'm not here with a bunch of old folks. These are the spirits that should be the most alive if you're mature. You should be the most conditioned to throw off the flesh, jump in with the spirit. You should be the one that is the easiest to be able to worship, dance, smile. This should be the most predominant group. I don't care that young people are young. That don't mean nothing to me. They can't outdance me in the spirit. They can't outshout me in the spirit. They can't outrun me in the spirit. I mean, they way more trouble than I am. You can say, well, they're faking the praise. Well, I at least applaud their effort of trying to yield to the spirit. Because you're not faking your hurt. I just happen to know you are now. Thanks for letting me see it. Why don't you get with me and I'll give you an answer by the counsel of God to deliver you out of all your trouble. That when you're in trouble, you can still laugh. I've had four troubling things come my way this past week. Four troubling things. They're troubling. <laughs> They're troubling. <laughs> but you know, uh, what can I do? I mean, all I can do is say, praise the Lord. Because at the end of the day, if God Almighty creates a perfect heaven and a perfect earth, and he cannot stop pride in perfection realm, then I can't stop it in the church here. But I can preach in a way that will deliver you so that you'll have the same opportunity that man has now because the devil didn't get that opportunity. He wants to be wicked. He wants to be against God. He'll never be redeemed and he will be cast into the lake of fire. And all who are prideful will go with him. So if you want to be full of pride, I won't see you in hell. Other than, you know, I look over. <laughs> ah, I knew it. <laughs> and you called me a liar. I mean, there's no redemption when you're in a second death, you understand? It's not like, oh, man, can I help you out? No. Abraham's like, can't send him over, guys. This is done. This is settled. You on that side. Now, we leaving first when Jesus dies and when he's resurrected, we going with him. But you're going to be here for a little while longer. And then when they let you go, it's only for judgment. And everyone that's in hell today or in the grave where there's torment is because they're prideful. They let some situation hurt them. And they want their way of changing it instead of the Lord. Pride manifests in perfect environments. So saints, you are not without risk. 
The only way to guarantee you'll never be lifted up in pride is that this is what the word says. And I'm doing it. Crucify my flesh. I don't care how I feel. It's the right thing to do because it's God's way of doing it. And I refuse to be. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's no man comes to the Father but through me. His pathway to eternal life, and we're all eternal beings now. It's the quality of your eternity you're addressing. Because the greatest deception in the room today is your breathing. Because your breathing makes you think you're alive. Now, you are alive physically, but you could be dead spiritually. Now, what is dead spiritually? You have no relationship with God. Your spirit man is cut off because you have been prideful your whole life. What's pride? You've been doing it your way. Do you know why most mature believers fall into pride? It's because they had an expectation based upon the knowledge they knew of God to handle a particular situation and he had another way he was going to do it. And they're mad at the way he's done it. This is what it sounds like. You mean as much all that I've done for you, how I've lived for you, how I've done this, that, starts giving them the resume of what they've done for him. And then you're going to let this happen to me? You're going to let that happen to me? I can't believe this. I can't believe you would let me go through this kind of hurt. You know, I can tell you what your king's saying. He's saying, what about me? What did I do to deserve all that I got? What did I do when I came to the earth and only healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out devils, fed people, clothed people, delivered people, spoke words of life, quoted my father, prophesied, made things better for people, here to lay down my life for them. Because I know victory is still mine. This is temporary. Haven't you learned how humanity is yet? Don't you know that the human spirit, even though born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, can still change their thinking back to the ways of the world and act like they're worldly again? If you know that, then why are you so shocked when it happens? Instead of saying, well, this is the way to come out, this is the way to change, this is the way to get back in fellowship, mad I'm glad Paul didn't say Demas he's left me seriously and in the same letter he went on to say when I had to defend myself everybody left me nobody was there to help defend me when they wanted to kill me all I've done for you and your churches and nobody can show up at my trial he said, but that's all right. God didn't leave me. You know, and I'm not going to leave my purpose. Because you know what? The sum total of my life is not based upon whether you're here or not. The sum total of my life is in Christ and doing His will. And at the end of the day, I'll forgive you because it doesn't bother me. At the end of the day, you're not going to keep me from accomplishing God's will for me. That's why Hebrews chapter 13 says, Obey your leaders who keep watch over your soul. And let them do this with joy and not with grief, where it will be unprofitable for you. Let's just do the word together, and it'll be joy, unspeakable joy, and full of glory. But if you're not going to do the word,
And that's why you know people get off. At the end of the day, they just got full of pride. They just got full of pride. And now they live deceived lives. Using the word. But every head bowed and every eye closed, no one's looking around. Don't be prideful today. Just come to the Lord. Now, if you're here today and you want to be water baptized, because you're born again, but you've never been baptized,